And we're live. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of the ACDC. I'm Mo from Mo's Game Table, and we're going to be interviewing our special guest here today, Sebastian Bay, about his game, Littoral Commander. Welcome to the show, Sebastian. Great to see you again. Hey, great to be on here with you, Mo. And uh, Littoral Commander, it's going to be hitting the shores here pretty soon. Yeah, hopefully um, by the end of February, they'll be sent, being sent out to our uh, pre-orders, uh, which um was originally hopefully to be earlier, but we ran into some snags on the manufacturing side, but uh, everyone has been super patient and considerate. So it's been really appreciated on, on, on our side of how people have been patient with us. Well, you know, uh, issues on manufacturing side, this is my shocked face. Uh, <laughs> that happens for every game. I think that's kind of par for the course. If you don't have a manufacturing snag somewhere along the line, uh, yeah. you are a very lucky person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, part, yeah. Of, part and parcel of, of game design and production and, you know, uh, getting those games out there. But how are you feeling about that game? I mean, it's only a month away and your baby's going to be arriving. <laughs> yeah, um, a little, uh, it's um, honestly a, a cocktail of emotions. Uh, first, like I've designed games for work for the uh, defense community for a long time, but this is my first commercial on the shelf game. So it's very exciting and also uh, nervous and uh Jason, uh, when I was telling him, uh, Jason Matthews, when I told him I, I was nervous, he told me his story of a, like uh, a, a review he got on, I think, Board Game Geek, where he's like, uh, someone said like, oh, this is the worst game ever. It'll never survive. Why There will be no audience for this. And I was like, oh, man, uh, if that's what you got for Twilight Struggle. <laughs> right? uh, it, it comforted me in, in some ways, but also I'm like, oh, God, like people are just, you know, it, just hate's going to rain. Um but also at the same time, really excited because uh, the game has been out in the fleet with the Marine Corps uh, and Navy for a, a while now, over a year and a half. Uh, and we got great feedback uh, as you know, and Jim and I have been working on the commercial version and we have been adapting it, uh, getting feedback, um, adding new cards that we originally didn't have when we sent out the prototypes. But more than anything, it's been great feedback of like, hey, like this is a great tool, like, um, we're adapting it. We're using it. They even tell me of the rules they change and so forth. So it's been uh, really exciting. Oh, that's great. And I can, I can say right now, having played the game, that was a while back that I played. I haven't, I don't know if you've made any major changes to it since then. Uh, and this was back before it was a commercial uh, product at that point. So I'm sure there's been tweaks made uh, since, but uh, I can say with hundred percent certainty, it's a good game. It is a really good game. And uh, at least from my perspective, we had a really great conversation after playing because to me, it just started the wheel spinning on the actual problem for the MLR out there in the real world. And when a game does that, that means that it's doing things right because it's, it's getting the gamer not only engaged during the game, but you're thinking about it after and that's fantastic. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I remember a game. Yeah. And we had that long discussion about the Marine Latour regiment, about, you know, shore based fires, the logistics of it, um, you know, the trade-offs that force design 2030, the Marine Corps is making. And yeah, just like you said, the point of the game is to be a, a intellectual sandbox is what I always tell the players, right? It is a, way for you to kick around uh the sand castles build new ones and see how they work and that's why we went with the mechanics that we did so for example i chose a card engine for the joint capability cards that represent the vast majority of joint capabilities while pretty much only the marine littor regiment and a surface action group are on the table um so you can play everything from cyber to influence operations to soft operations um at a very small tactical level in terms of effect but the units you maneuvering are only really the marine littoral regiment now uh, uh yeah oh go ahead go ahead oh no go ahead now i was going to say uh before we go any further for those who may not be familiar with the game why don't you give a background as to uh, how the uh, what the game is about and then how you came up with the, the design itself yeah, absolutely. So the Troll Commander is uh, a you know, two to six player uh, educational war game aimed at looking at the future of war, right? Um, looking at a hypothetical conflict between uh, the PRC and the US, right? And as a central look at the Marine Corps, uh, looking at the maritime environment, hence the title, uh, the Toro Commander, really looking at the space between uh, land, uh, ground combat, and then maritime combat. So that's really the focus. Uh, and it's really designed for um, 
uniform service members like NCOs and uh, junior captains and majors uh, who are for field grade officers, but also uh, civilians and students who are trying to look at the future of war and looking at how these systems interact at a tactical level. Um, and it's really meant as an exploratory game where you can test and try new ideas, but also set up new scenarios. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's where I think it's it's the most engaging. And to me, I think that's games are more engaging, <clears throat> excuse me, when you get down to the tactical level, because then people feel more of an investment because they're seeing literally what's happening at the you know granular level versus when you're just moving a counter that represents a division. You're like, oh, it's just a whole division. <laughs> you're moving them yeah. like one or two hexes. It's like, okay, yeah, but here you're moving individual units around. You're trying to make sure that uh, these guys stay alive. And and when you're taking in shots, you're knocking them down with your iron dome. When you're trying to shoot at them, they're knocking it down with their iron yeah. dome. This trade-off going back and forth. And then you're using all these joint capabilities that it's like, okay, well, how do we hit them from the sea? Okay, well, how do we hit them from, from space? Yeah. What do we do here? What do we do there? And you have a lot of different avenues to uh, approach how you solve the problem that, you know, that you've got in front of you. And I think that uh, it, it's a lot of fun that way. And it's, it's more of a, a wider exercise mentally, I think for, for the gamer. Now you said it's two to six. There's obviously because it's blocks, there's no way to really do solitaire. Is there? So uh, the commercial version. So one of the things we can talk about is some of the changes that we did from the block uh, com uh, prototype to the commercial game. So the new version does not have blocks. Um, that was a, a decision that J uh, JM and me uh, went through. And originally, I really was hesitant of a game re removing the blocks because the, the original version had blocks and I really enjoyed the blocks. Um, and I love like block games like the Columbia games, the Hammer Scots, and sort of like that, and Julius Caesar. Uh, but not going to lie, I think getting rid of the blocks in terms of counter density um, and also ease of, of moving some of the pieces was better. Um, some of the challenges, especially with the normal, you know, I mean, what was it? 0 0.8 blocks like they are they can get quite big and if you're trying to stack a battalion of platoon uh, in terms of platoons it can be really hard and heavy um so um that was that was one of the things we moved but yeah so it's all going to be just counters now yeah so counters uh we got some new custom counters for some of the pieces that were like sort of wooded pieces uh wood bits um and then we also got a lot more cards uh, in terms of like diversity of things that we look at uh, from everything from cyber to um, unmanned systems that we've included, but also ways to counter unmanned systems to, let's say, you know what I mean, um, physical kinetic destruction and interception, but also like, let's say, interception and so forth. And if you see hear that, that is my dog like playing with his bone <laughs> in my office. It was the only way he could not be like on my lap at the time. So, yeah. well, it's normal. I mean, it's good. It's like, Daddy, where are you? I need to come hang out with you. Yeah. <laughs> So now w this game obviously was a professional design at first, um, but it was something that you came up with. It was kind of like a side project. Uh, talk about oh, the yeah. genesis of the game. So the game uh, started off as a pet project during COVID. Literally, as we went into quarantine here on the States, I was like, well, everyone apparently is baking bread for some reason, <laughs> which I don't do. Um, and uh, I'm not musically talented, so I wasn't going to learn an instrument. So I was like, I'm just going to default to what I love, which is making games. Um, and this is a game idea that I had been chewing on for a long time as a concept, but a broad concept, which was uh, getting a game for NCOs to be played with their officers at like the company and battalion level. Like I wanted a game to be pushed down, right? Not for me to come and run it for them, which is usually what I do for commands in my day job, but for me to send down a game, teach them how to play, and then leave and have them continue playing it. Um, so the genesis of the Toral Commander as a topic itself came from Force Design 2030 and the Commandant's uh, planning guidance at the time in the Marine Corps about shaping what the future of the Marine Corps would be. Um, and I really want to address that because I wanted everyday Marines to understand why the Commandant was making the choices they were doing, why analysts and Marine Corps, um, the Marine Corps were looking at these problems and saying, hey, these are problems that we need to find solution for. And these are the solutions we think there are, uh, whether they're right or wrong, or completely 100%, right? Mm -hmm. So that was the genesis of it. And my professional so focus has always been looking at the future of warfare so this is something near and dear to my heart and i always want and love educational games so it started during the pandemic um and the quarantine and continued on and i just 
just hustled to find people who were helping, uh, willing and uh, to help me with the playtesting. And a lot of Marines helped us. And we eventually sent it out to like 100 prototype copies uh, as we did uh, playtesting over a year and a half. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I thought that I found so awesome about it, and for those uh, who are curious, at the bottom I've got the ticker that's got the link to where you can get the game. It's actually with the Deets Foundation, and you can go to that website there, and it is uh, up now for pre-order. Uh, actually, well, they have it up for order pre-order because it's not shipping yet, but uh, you can get in on it now And because I because I have not yet get, got my order, and I was waiting until it was near production or production was almost done before I put my order in. I didn't do the whole, um, what was it? Kickstarter, not Kickstarter. Yeah. Game, game founder, Kickstarter. Yeah, one yeah. You did. I didn't do that at, at that point. I was like, I'll, I'll wait till next year when it's available and then I'll go ahead and I'll pick up a copy. <laughs> Cause I was like, eh, I got so much other stuff going on. And actually at the time we were prepping our house to sell and move to another house. And it was just oh, yeah. such a mess. I was like, you know what? I'll wait till I have my new address and everything before I, get all that square away. So, so I'm going to, now that it's almost shipping, I'm going to go ahead and put the order in. But um, I remember when we played, one of the things that I found the most engaging <clears throat> and it was, and it was uh, just to me was a lot of fun was because we're dealing with military people is the fact, the, the planning, the pre-planning of getting all your, your cards and all in place and how you, everyone's looking at it from a slightly different perspective. And then you're trying to come together to get the, uh, plan in place as to how, what you want to do. And the scenario we play was pretty simple. I mean, it was like, okay, the CCP ships are coming around the, the island. They're going to get through this little, basically a little narrow channel and how are you going to stop them? So we came up with all these different things. We even like uh, the remote, uh, what was it? Remote ships or whatever. The remote yeah, the small boats. Yeah. Small boats. So we just ran up on them and tried to yeah. tack in and stuff. But it was really interesting to see that, uh, that interplay between everybody as to how they were approaching it and having the seriousness of the military mindset there talking about it, I thought yeah. was a lot of fun. That was like a, that was very meta. It was like a yeah. game within a game that I thought was just so engaging. Yeah. So one of the reasons I personally find the planning stage really interesting and it gets better as you know, the game more, right. And as you sort of build your tactical knowledge, but the game doesn't, like I said, doesn't require you to be good or have be a good planner or anything. It's just, it is better. Uh, if you are a planner, it is better mm -hmm. if you d do a lot of war games. Right. Um, so, and one of the major constructs is that like you have this huge deck that you would love to get a bunch of, right. And let's say Mo and I are on a team, but we only have 10 po command points between us, which each card is rated um, in terms of price of command points from one through five, right? Which means that we can get two awesome cards at five, right? In mm -hmm. the beginning, or you know, I mean, five cards at two or 10 cards at one, uh, whatever the combination of, right? But that is a trade-off because let's say Mo is a surface action commander. He's a maritime. He thinks all about ships. He has three ships in his SAG uh, or surface action group. And then I'm a, merit, uh, I'm a Marine Corps element, let's say um, uh, expeditionary advanced base, and I have high Mars, logistics, air defense. So I have a different concern, right? And depending on the threat, or if it's all ships, then maybe I'm supporting Mo. But if I'm, let's say, fighting a battalion of light tanks of, uh, and infantry, right? Then maybe Mo is the one supporting me, right? And so forth. And, and it's always a negotiation. People have from different backgrounds always have different perspectives and sometimes that clashes right um I, I talk about the story a lot when i talk about the Toro commanders when um we had a air defense uh army um major and he was like hey we should really think about that and you know uh, you know red has lots of ballistic missiles we should really think over that and because we don't have that capability right now in our order of battle we should probably bring that in a card as an attachment right and uh, the two other marines were like oh no it's fine right it's, it's okay like let's get these munitions extend our range and it wasn't that either was wrong right Mm -hmm. uh, there was just a tension of how much to do what, right? They're both right that they're, they're, they're they had a range problem, and they were both right that they weren't within um, uh, ballistic missile defense, uh, uh, ballistic missile range, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, right? Um, so the real tension was how do you get around that? And eventually, what ended up happening was uh, their logistics uh, company got destroyed by you know DF twenty ones, and it was pretty brutal and they you know, slogged it through and they adapted a little bit um but it was hard hard running after that but the the air defense um 
major was like, Hey, you know, I told you. And he had this look and he's like, I need to get a beer when we were doing the hot wash. <laughs> afterwards. Uh, but it was good. But the thing is that it's not to say that, Hey, if you just followed his uh, direction, uh, it would have been perfectly right. Right. Um, there's a, a dynamic of like, Hey, you know what I mean? What are you trying to anticipate that the red side will do? Right. Mm-hmm. And how do I best adapt to that, but also build a bit of margin in the game, which the game is, unforgiving purposefully right uh unlike other typical commercial games it does not have lots of balancing mechanics right Mm -hmm. like i was just playing scythe yesterday with a couple of friends and if you get out to a hot start there are mechanics in scythe where it can sort of other players can catch up and there's like you know me uh the the front leader can go backwards and so forth and that's perfectly designed to make it more fun and engaging right who wants Mm -hmm. to be know that in in a 10 turn game that on turn three that you already lost right why do you why would you put you through the suffer the suffering of the next seven turns right Mm -hmm. um so there's a bit of that right um but my game is there's no uh there's no real true balancing mechanic uh in the game itself in the rule set right um and they're trying we try to balance some things in the scenario how it's set up and where you start and so forth but afterwards it is much more unforgiving because we mm-hmm. wanted our, our primary audience, which is war gamers and um, military officers and NCOs to be like, Hey, like the edge is always raised razor thin, right? Mistakes matter and they have yeah. tremendous consequences, right? So make them now on this map while you can, and there are no lives at stake and learn those mistakes now. And also experiment, right? Um, I've learned some crazy ideas and, um, and concepts that I've you know, played with a bunch of corporals at a table and be like, hey, all right, let's play this game. And they will surprise me. And even though I've seen 200 plus playthroughs of my own game, right? Mm-hmm. So it's always interesting what people bring to the table. Well, never underestimate the ingenuity and the just the balls of an NCO. <laughs> it's just the truth. They'll come oh, up yeah. with the thing that it's like, let's do this. And you're like, no, that probably won't work out well. And then you're like, damn, it did work. I can't <laughs> believe that. But that that's great to be surprised with your own design because it means that uh, people are looking at all different angles that you didn't even look at, you know, even in development of the commercial game, you know, further development, you didn't pick up on. And that, that right there shows that there's a lot of expanse to the game itself and, and there's depth. Yeah. And I like the idea that you did not balance the game. Uh, balance games are great for hobby games. Um, you know, and that includes some hobby war games because you don't want to get in there and like make the first move uh, wrong first move and then you're done. Yeah. Um, a great example of a, of a Euro that does that is a uh, food chain magnet. If you basically make the first, I think the, the first couple of turns, if you screw up, you can find yourself out of the game and not even realize it yeah. until you've played it a few times and you're like, yeah, I just screwed that up. And now I'm out of the game. It's like, then you're disengaged and that's not yeah. fun. Um, plus war, which is what this is modeling combat between, um, you know, the U S and China in this, in this instance, uh, it's not going to be fair. You're going to always want to stack the deck as much as you can in your favor, but sometimes it's not going to be in your favor. And the balancing is actually in how the people pick their cards. And of course the scenario design, like you talked about, um, for the ex- you're talking about expanding it a little bit further. Uh, we were talking about that backstage. Do you want to hit on that at all, or can you not mention that right now? Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. So, oh, hello, Winston. Um, uh, <laughs> um, so we're looking at expansion in Euro- the European theater right now. We're looking at the Baltic, sort of Baltic to hmm. Scandinavia esque area. Um, we're trying to look at the combination of the high north towards like the Baltic Sea as two concurrent maps that will sort of like um, be put to- against each other. So you can play sort of that border area in the north or sort of a maritime uh, environment in uh, sort of uh, the Baltic Sea. And our hope right now is to expand uh, the littoral commander universe beyond the Marine Littoral Regiment. And have the base unit in the next game be what I researched to be the future ARGMU, right? Um, which is the amphibious ready group uh, marine expeditionary unit for who, those who are not Marine Corps uh, slang worthy, right? In terms of acronyms. <laughs> uh, so really about like what is the the uh, 
what does the uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit, right, the Marines on ships being mobile and global um, really look like? And what does that uh, entail for future operations uh, in Europe, right? Um, and looking at a lot of unclassed sources and a lot of reading and what are also listening. A lot of my research for the Toro Commander was listening to what's really smart Marines, soldiers, airmen were talking about um, in their water cooler talks, right, about hey, like, I think this is a great idea. I think this is a terrible idea. I wish we could explore and kick the tires on this idea um, and so forth. And hopefully we'll inc also include uh, a bit of a sneak peek, which is also the Marine uh, Multi-Domain Task Force, or the MDTF, mm -hmm. which is a new formation. Uh, think of it like a Marine Littoral Regiment, uh, a Marine Littoral Regiment times like four, right? Uh, which is nice. your typical Army style, right? Um, and we're ho to hoping to see how those two formations really work in Europe. Uh, but there are a couple of complications with it uh, with, in terms of adjusting the game rules because um, the ARGMU works a little different than the Marine Littoral Regiment. Uh, and also the MDTF is just vastly bigger uh, and its ranges are just bonkers long, right? Uh, mm -hmm. the map, right? So like, uh, so like for example, uh, the Army announced that it's going to have a battery of unclassed hypersonic missiles. So those things are like, they can shoot far, right? Like all across Europe, right? Right. Yeah um across the pacific so like how do you incorporate that uh originally like, right now it's like a card but it's just hypersonics from like guam and so forth right and, and other places um but the other question is like how do you do that uh across the theater and still be where you're in direct command of those units right versus being supported by what the cards really represent so yeah. we're still working on some of the kinks as i um I mean, adjust the game rules, but I'm really excited about it because it gets to look at a different formation, different geography, uh, and so forth. And there are so many parts of the world um, that are geographically interesting, tactically, right? Like mm -hmm. um, the Horn of Africa. Um, I love to do like um, when we were experimenting with where to do in Europe, we looked at the Danish Straits. Um, and I keep learning every time, like, oh, like these Danish Straits would be really interesting, but like the traffic ability is really interesting there, but also the depth uh, for what submarines and what high draft ships can do. is also interesting there. Um, but I'm also hoping to in the future future, um, which I can talk about a little bit is to go back to the Indo Pacific and go to our allies and partners. So hopefully uh, get someone to partner with to do the British, the Japanese, the Australians. Um, and so forth, and sort of add to the world of that is Littoral Commander. So you, you can do mix and max coalition forces and so forth. Mm, that would be interesting to see how that would all work out. And then uh, maybe, oh, it would probably still stay the same two to eight players. So you could even probably expand it up to like maybe 10 or 12 if you wanted to, which I know you like to do that because of the fact that uh, when you guys run your games, that you were doing it for larger groups. And it, if yeah. you can get a game with 10 or 12 people can participate actively, then that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's the hope. And you're, usually when I run it for military education purposes, um, I will have a player uh, be represented by like two people, right? Like uh, normally a surface action group or a task force commander, what we call players in our group, um, we will have two players. So Lamo and I can sort of like, especially if I'm not familiar with games or, or hesitant about games or reluctant or even hostile towards games, right? Mm -hmm. And Mo is not, right? We can bounce each other ideas off each other and it's not so jarring. So, and Mo will listen to half the rules. I will listen to half the rules. I will remember half the rules. Mo will remember half the rules. But also, hopefully, they become for different backgrounds, right? So mm -hmm. Mo, let's say, is infantry guy. I'm a you know, air defense guy or air wing guy and we were talking about hey these are things because often one thing i will say 100 percent does not matter what rank you are what service you are is that the first time you play you will gravitate to what you know right so if you're an air wing guy and if you're an aviator from any service you will choose air stuff regardless of if it's a good decision right comfort you're zone <laughs> yeah your comfort zone you gravitate towards it um and it's funny because i've seen this play over 300 times right and from you know, I mean, generals to colonels to all the way down to like a bunch of PFCs and corporals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing to see how much they gravitate to what they know uh, because they default to what their knowledge set is in terms of tactical decision making, right? Sure. Um, it's really interesting um, to really dig at that and we're like, okay, what does that mean, right? What did you learn about other people's communities, how they think, how they see the problem, how see, they see the world? 
Yeah. And it's interesting when people do that. And what you were just talking about, about like me and you playing and me learning half the rules and, or remembering half the rules, you remember half the rules together. We get the whole rule set. That's kind of war gaming in a nutshell right there. And that's one of the things I think is so advantageous to the war game community versus other uh, gaming communities is other gaming communities are really more about, okay, how can I get the upper hand? Cause I want to win this game. Whereas war gamers, which is funny because we're actually gaming war, we're gaming conflict, we tend to be more cooperative is because I think it's not thing. It comes down to we're learning 20, 30, 40, 50 page rule books yeah. and everybody realistically knows most of us are not going to absorb that entire thing, especially the first time you yeah. play it. So oh, yeah. if we do it together. We can, you know, knock it out. So uh, that coopetition type of thing. Uh, really does help and and it makes the game more enjoyable but also at the same time it does play on everyone's strengths because some things are going to naturally attach to you mentally than uh, others and then the the other player will pick up things that you don't pick up we did have one question here i've been meaning to get to this is from tukarin saying in relation to force design 2030 any will any of the live exercise experiments on the field have an impact on the development of littoral commander game oh man uh this is a great question so I was, I was, dis- well, right now, <laughs> the, the current version is set. Like it's set in stone. It's like in the printer. It's going to be uh, coming on um, uh, to people's doors. So there's a bit of right now, the current copy won't change um, as it is now. But as I was designing it in the last two years, really, um, and we we're play testing it, it went through many, many <laughs> evolutions, um, expansions in scope, uh, contractions in scope. Like for a perfect example, right? Um, we're running, uh, we're doing this sort of maritime focus on surface ships and sort of like a little bit of unmanned stuff, uh, and like your Marine Corps units originally, that was a really tight focus of the game. Um, and then I forget when, I think it was like 2020, yeah, 2020 or 21, um, Commandant Berger goes on proceedings and he talks about how the Marine Littoral Regiment is concerning how it will support submarines, right? Mm. And the next like couple times, like for the next month or so, like every group of Marines that I took this game to to like get playtesting, get thoughts on, they would ask, hey, what about uh, like submarines? Are, are those in the game? Because that's what the Commandant's looking at, right? I was like, ah, curses, um, <laughs> the words. Uh, so I had, that's why submarines, like this uh, very sort of uh, simplistic submarine mechanic is included in the game. That is mm-hmm. literally can be traced back to that Proceedings Commandant podcast, right? Nice. Um, also, Jared Samuelson was super helpful in helping me understand submarines and how to simplify them and so forth. Rob, like, you know what I mean? Enraging all submariners everywhere. Um, but it is a, a really simple sum, uh, submarine mechanic. It's just to make them think about the underwater, underwater um domain mm-hmm. and i will also say like our order of battle or the units in the marine latour regiment do not look exactly like what uh the commandant has put down in the tentative manual or uh um what has been discussed in the open source to be exact or what they the marine corps is thinking mainly because the marine corps is thinking is also evolving from its own experiments right mm-hmm. um as it's you know what i mean testing things like, and saying hey like look at like i just saw uh a news article of say how the Marine Corps has um, tested the integration of Iron Dome with its air defense system, mm-hmm. right? So, which is like interesting, and then which was what um, my game sort of uses Iron Dome on. And one of the reasons we chose it is because it was had so much unclassed data on it about what and how it engaged targets, uh, mainly because the Israelis use so much of it, and there's so much written about Iron Dome um and so forth so we went back over that over a future system what the army is trying to build right now which had very little information in the open source so um it has evolved a, a lot of ways of like what systems we're modeling to be proxies or uh, hold-ins for certain capabilities that they talk about but also what the order of battle will be um and i was surprised that uh when the tentative manual came out how the the order of battle was a little different from what we thought it was uh, as we did the research and so forth and did the lead work, but also how the game still allows you to play the, the order of battle in the tentative manual. You just have to use the reinforcements as the main order of battle. But um, most of the scenarios don't even use the entire regiment um, mm. because I'm a skeptic of mobility and skeptic of crises where um, 
I, if I was your enemy, I will never let you set up your entire defensive line before I attack, mm -hmm. right? If I can, I will attack while you are still in progress, right? While only half your force is there. So, like, the game that Mo mentioned, the scenario is called Lose on Pass, right? It's a, mm -hmm. a sea denial game where, like, the Marine Corps is trying to stop the Chinese surface action group from passing a particular strait um, in the northern Philippines. And... It only has like about half ish the regiment, right? And mm -hmm. um, there's a meta reason of why that is in terms of player, uh, how many players we wanted. We wanted the first scenario to be sort of like limited and like you don't have to control like 20 counters, right? Like, oh, you have these like eight counters, right? That's it, right? Um, that's all you have to worry about, right? For your first time. Um, but also on top of that is a part of me is like, hey, if if I see as the Chinese or, you know what I mean, the red side, um, you're moving things, I'm going to move even faster to try to stop or engage you before all your stuff gets there, right? Um, and make my move, right? Similar if it was the other way around, right? So there's always that, right? So it's uh, interesting to play around if you're like, hey, well, what if I add this third player? Or if I change some of the order of battlefront scenarios, which some of our uh, Marine Corps units have done and to great effect. Well, the other thing, too, is uh, one of the differences real world versus a game is when you go into a game, you both know the order of battle. So I know that, well, OK, he might bring in some reinforcements because I already see them on the reinforcement schedule on the scenario. I like the idea of saying uh, there's we're not going to talk reinforcements. Neither side knows what reinforcements could have, you know, could happen. And then just randomly they show up or they're they're available to either side unknown to the other side and then it's like wait a minute how come you had you only had four units at the beginning how do you have nine well reinforcements <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's yeah. not fair huh? combat's not fair oh yeah <laughs> but, absolutely you know i like that idea of you know if there's a way to incorporate that by without letting either side know and again that goes to that that talk about uh imbalance it's like well oh, it's yeah. supposed to be imbalanced <laughs> Oh yeah, uh, so great. Um, you and I are on the same page on that. So mm -hmm. the order of battle for your setup is just unavoidable that you have to sort of know what the other side is, especially sure. if it's at the same booklet. They're yeah, like, exactly. you're like, oh, I'll just turn the next page. It's right there, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a, a fundamental element of that. But uh, after you set up, but one of the things like you know, it is um, uh, our game is a ISR based game where you have to find the enemy before you fire upon them, right? So like. I know your ship or formation over there, and I know relatively what your formation is, but I don't know which one is the, uh, a destroyer, which one is a cruiser, which one is uh, whatever that is, right? Or a decoy even. So you have to flip it over to, to find what uh, a target is and then fire. And also to follow up on Mo's point about reinforcements is um, the card decks, what we call the joint capability cards, the JCCs, have reinforcement cards that you can buy and not tell the other side, right? So mm -hmm. like, you can get reinforcements by C-130 or by amphibious sea lift through the Navy and Army and get resupplied or um, have soft come in, right? Like there are cars that provide you physical units, right, on the board, right? You can have an MV-22 uh, Osprey come in and drop you a bunch of Marine infantry dudes, right? Um, and it can be a uh, fight that way, right? But um, those cost a lot of, like, points. So, like, you have to base it off, like, hey, is it worth these people at this time, right, uh, and certain things, right? Um, and it was fantastic to see how players engage those things. Like one of the little clever things I did um, that sort of like broke the game, but didn't break the game was um, we're playing this air fuel seizure as a test scenario. It's not in the commercial version, but um, and the uh, the blue and red side was you're know, duking it out and blue lure them into their lines. Right. And not to like encircle them, but just get them deep. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, um uh, away from the airfields they already seized. And then they dropped uh, uh, SOF and MV-22 infantry guys on the airfield that the Red had seized. But there was, the Red line had progressed so far that they really didn't have time in terms of the of the game to turn around, right? But then they would sort of be turning their back to the objective that they were aiming and driving towards. So I was like, oh, man, you, you got them, right? You know what I mean? So it was, it was a group of captains. And it, was, it was a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, no, that that's really cool. Now, have you ever considered like random events? Oh yeah, so the game does have event cards. Um, um, so I call them event cards, but they're a little bit of event slash rules cards. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Um, so like for example, there are 
Um, some scenarios I'll say, hey, draw a random event card at the beginning of the game, right? Just to like change the rules, change a little bit of replayability. Um, like uh, one of my favorite ones is like displace civilians on the field. So we mm. use these little gray cubes where it essentially says, hey, uh, each side will pick a hex, right? Uh, uh, three hexes and put a gray cube there. These now those hexes are impassable, and they every turn they will move. So you'll roll to move them. So they'll move move in a direction depending on how you roll on the d20, right? Mm -hmm. All right. No, so they start like migrating around the board, right, um, and so forth, sort of uncontrollably, right. So they can get in your way on your highways, <laughs> and and in some maps it's worse than others, right? Like uh, Taiwan, Luzon, right. Uh, there are big places so like if you pick up a spot sort of in the corner that's fine they'll be out of the way but the reason that we choose that each side chooses three is that i want to mess it up for you and you want to mess it up for me and they'll sort of chaotically roam around the board uh and it can be really bad because some places on the maps and and some maps in particular only have a few really good highways which means if they're sitting on like the 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 the, the green spaces uh, which are the lowest rating and then it can be a really hard day for you because you can't shoot through them, right? We don't allow that, right, in our game because we don't want to be teaching that, right? So the idea is like, do I go through? Uh, how do I go around them, right? Um, uh, using non-lethal weapons, right? Which there are some capabilities of those in the deck, but hopefully you brought those, right, and so forth. And there's air um, uh, weather, right, where where you can't play air cards and so forth, but they're not all events cards because. Um, one of the things that we had a lot of discussion about when we were designing the game is like uh, how effective is air defense, right? Uh, how effective is long range fires, right? Um, how should you play certain rules, right? Um, should we have more than three action points, right? Three orders to give uh, a turn in two hours, right? So mm -hmm. we made, uh, or I made a bunch of specific rules altercations, right? Of saying like, hey, if you don't believe air defense is this proactively good in the future, right? Then subtract this number and we'll play and see how that, we can play the same scenario and just change this one mm. variable and see how it works, right? Yeah. Um, and it's been really enlightening and interesting. Um, I enjoy it a lot. And we have a couple other ones, but I only want to put my favorite ones in the commercial versions. <laughs> for Europe. Well, what about when it comes to the random event uh, thing? What I was going to get at with that is, uh, maybe as a random event, you get an extra reinforcement that you didn't plan on. You didn't pay for that. No one expects. And you know what? You get, you get chopped another company or something like that, or, or battalion or whatever gets sent to you or another ship, um, more fires. So that way you, you have a benefit that you did not expect before. That was it. this, this was in use over here. They were nearby they didn't need them. So we're going to just send them over to you, that sort of thing. Uh, cause again, that screws with the other player. And they were like, this isn't fair. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so uh, I actually have the reverse. Uh, it's not a good thing; it's a bad thing. Take it away. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I take it. Uh, so uh, there, there are two different uh, event cards: one for red, one for blue, uh, that are bad for them. Where, um, for the, for example, for the U.S. is um, Korea. There's a crisis on the Korean Peninsula, and you have, let's say, ten cards. Right, you give up half of them. Like they're mm -hmm. just being chopped away and taken away. Right. Um, so it's like, and it, it, it sucks, yeah. <laughs> honestly, um, I hate you. that's what I'd be thinking if that happens to me. It <laughs> never is like, oh yes. Like this is an interesting adaptation to my tactical decision-making. They're all like, Sebastian, you're the worst. Uh, and the other side is like, yes, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Chinese have a very similar card that does a very similar effect. Right. Well, the point is like, how do I, uh, limit of uh, most of the events honestly are negative uh to be frank um mm -hmm. and they're only positive to you because they're negative to the other person um but yeah i think that's awesome i think it should be because you know like i was saying there okay i get the benefit well which you you're doing the the same thing just in a different way where you're taking away and i think that is uh really fantastic because uh every thing that a commander is going to deal with a ground commander is going to deal with in combat or prepping for it is going to be negative. It's not going to be positive. You're going to be, you're basically just holding the, the levy walls up is all you're really doing every time. Uh, and then you just, you just, the hits keep coming and you have to keep dodging them and just deal with it as you can. And I think that's fantastic that you're doing that. You have that right angle to make people realize that, you know what, today's going to be a really crappy day and tomorrow's not looking any better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely.
So we got a question from Dave Burden. How are you representing UAVs and UGVs in the game? Great question. Um, so although our game is tactical, it is still, the hexes are still quite large. They're 20 kilometers across, um, 160-ish uh, square kilometer area. So it's not that you're fighting door to door or block to block in our game, mainly because the Marine Latour Regiment has such long ranges that we have to incorporate. So um, ground combat can only happen in hexes that you co-locate in the assumption that you are moving and engaging actively to each other. Um, but you, we have UAVs, obviously, and UGVs, and even UU, uh, UUSs uh, or UUVs and USVs, right, which underwater, unmanned, uh, under, unmanned underwater uh, vehicles and um, unmanned surface vehicles. Um, Say that real time, uh, three times real time, real fast. Time, right. <laughs> um, so the UAVs and the UGVs, which are ground vehicles and aerial vehicles that are unmanned, uh, they are predominantly used as attachments minus UAVs. Um, so depending on, so the cards that we talked about a lot in the joint capability cards, they represent a lot of capabilities that you can attach to your units, like engineers, right? Like you're like, hey, I have this platoon of engineers. I'm attaching it to this platoon and they will be, together right and the card effect can be done by the unit that i've attached it to right so if i attach it to third platoon bravo company they can do that thing right mm -hmm. right uh and you attach it by sliding it underneath the unit card um and ugvs uh work pretty much the same way it's like hey i have this ugv it will increase my lethality uh and usually hit points so most units are uh hit points of two Right before you're destroyed or eliminated or combat ineffective, but uh, if you have UGVs, your combat power goes up, but also you can take more hits because the assumption is that you have more um, uh, un unmanned systems that can take casualties for you, right? Um, so that's a baked-in assumption about that, and that uh, is uh, increases your units, your lethality, your combat value, but also your hit points, and that's how we usually model UGVs. Um, UA, uh, UAVs were a little more complicated because they have different classes, right? So like small tactical uh, uh, UAVs, like um, class what we call in the military, what we call class one, two, or three, which are small things that you either uh, chuck into the air, what you see a lot of in Ukraine, right? We we have those attached to units like UGVs and say, hey, uh, you can a unit that is its host can launch it and it has a range or a tether, right? That the mm -hmm. uh, the UAS. Um, has to fly right so you can say hey it can never go beyond 10 hexes from his host if his host disappears it dies uh, it can only move three hexes a turn right so because they're not like super fast or mobile right so they have to trek across the battlefield uh so that's an, uh how we do uavs um for other larger uavs like uh what we would call like group five right predators and things we do uh cards that just have effects across the map no, that's uh, really interesting. Now I got another interesting question for you. The game's new to me, late to the party. Sounds excellent. Can you talk a bit about how you model cyber in the game? Because that's yeah. one of the domains, one of the major domains uh, now. I'm so um I will stop me if I nerd out too much because this is one of the <laughs> things I, I, I really love about this game. Um so one I so every designer has something they're really proud of in their game, right? Um even if the game is like uh, you see all the words because of, of your entire system, there's usually one or two things you're like, God, I love this thing about my game, right? Uh, or of the games you play or in love, right? So this is the thing I love about my game, which is um, what I call the, the the tactical network mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't talk about fires and sensing and future warfare without talking to cyber or EMS jamming or just degradation of of like uh information in the field right especially at the tactical level like mo like how many times like our radios don't work right or we can't get in charge of higher or <laughs> yeah. um or just or even our like our, our walkie talkies our radio or, or don't work right mm -hmm. so information as a commodity i want to increase but also include the effects of cyber at the tactical level so he's like in my game because it's a tactical game, you're not like turning off the lights of like uh of los angeles or doing something crazy like that right the game is really like how do i have tactical effects on uh ships and formations companies and on uh, platoons right um and each player and whenever you play your game or each team must play this what we call a tactical network card it's free it is one of the joint capability cards it, it has pictures in the rule book and says hey you must play this open on, on your table and it is it does nothing really right mm -hmm. uh until it breaks <laughs> right so 
when you have no cubes or nothing bad has happened to you, that card does has no effect. All your combat values are as they are written, and you play the rules as written. When you start thinking and caring about this card is when Mo or somebody else it does, and they played this game and they felt the pain of it, uh, and they start exploiting it, which is every time you play an EMS or electro, electric magnetic spectrum card, right? Something like jamming or something like that, right? Or a cyber card, right? And they'll have, be highlighted in the card, right? And you're successful, right? So I play a tactical cyber card against Mo. I am successful. I'll do that specific effect, right? Whatever that effect is, which is, let's say, um, revealing a unit, right? Um, or uh, paralyzing a unit from moving from or, or doing anything for a turn, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, super tactical effects, right? Um, but more than that, I the successful cyber intrusion or EMS uh, jamming or whatever puts a, a cube on your tactical network, right? One cube does nothing, right? Two to three will reduce all your uh, attack values by like four and then by seven if it's more than four. But the point is like as I do more cyber things to you, right? As I dominate the uh, sort of in the information uh, space, right? In terms mm -hmm. of the cyber domain, uh, but also the EMS domain and so forth. And I, as I degrade your ability to pass information uh, effectively, pass quality information, your combat values go down across your entire formation, right? So what you need to say a 12 and below before on a D20 to hit, if I have four cubes on you, right? That that 12 is a five now, right? Right? But remember, my game has logistics, so like you may only have so many shots of that, right? So you're mm -hmm. like, do I fix my network or do I fire now, right, with my shitty data that I have, yeah. right, <laughs> of the opponent, right? Um, and it, it, it sneaks up on people, and it is it can be really wildly successful, but also wildly like ineffective, because um, to the much to the chagrin of uh, of other people that I work with um and talk to about cyber issues they're like why did you only have 50 50 chances for a lot of these things or 55 ish right um because i was like until you show me a document that is in the own class realm that i can tactically cyber attack a, a destroyer uh more than 50 50 or 55 percent then i'll do uh, i just i just don't know so i'm gonna use it as a toss-up yeah. uh ems tends to be a little higher because it has has been a more demonstrated capability over years in the cold war in ukraine and other places but um, that's why I did the way I did. Uh, the, I think it's really cool to do that because you have that cumulative effects. So you think, oh, he's 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 painting these uh, targets right now, or or you're jamming or whatever. That's not a big deal. Well, those emissions just build, and, and yeah. it, it crowds the information space there, and it just it cascades, and that's what you end up happening. You're like, oh, I'm shooting at twelve, I'm shooting at five. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But yeah. that's what happens in the real world. And I think that's a really simple but a very effective way of modeling yeah. the cyber war dom or the cyber domain in that instance. I mean, you can drill down. It could be more granular, but yeah. it's like the, that's another game entirely on its yeah. own. <laughs> exactly. And I wanted um, sort of operational tactical people uh, to really think about how the battlefield has changed, right, from like Cold mm -hmm. War games and so forth. Um and this is one of them, right? It's like information matters, the timeliness of that information and how the means of me to do that to you. Like one of the playthroughs I remember distinctly now, even now is uh, the blue team had like nine red degradation cubes on their technical network to the point that like they knew like there's no way for us to get rid of all the cubes. It's almost mathematically impossible, right? Um, because the, the other side was just uh, crushing them, right? In the side mm -hmm. of Um um and they were like you know what we just we just have to adapt like this is our new pk right our new mm -hmm. probability kill is five right so we have to plan accordingly right uh so that they just accepted it as the new reality uh because if it's like two or if you had two cubes and you're just barely degrading me i can knock off a cube with a card and we'll fix that right and it's not a problem right sure but when you're so deep in the hole and they let it be they f allowed it to fester too long right it was really bad right um and uh it was hilarious they 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 made a comeback for a little bit but they still lost but it was interesting it's also lessons learned and that's the thing about a game like that is you uh each time you go out there you ex should expect something different oh, yeah. and you you realize that you know what doesn't matter who the commanders are in the area in that unit um or in that theater 
you can never prepare for all eventualities. You can plan for them, but you can you don't have the assets, you don't have the the resources in place to be able to lock down every lock out. I should say every potential negative uh, thing that can impact you. And oh I, no! I think oh, that's yeah. that's a great lesson right there. When people play, they learn that that's not going to happen. Yeah, um, the game is fundamentally designed to stop you from being able to mitigate every risk. Right? Um, mm -hmm. It is. Just like the previous example, like is the ballistic missile defense that I'm worried uh, attacks the thing I'm worried about, or is it range? Is it air defense? Right? Is it supply? Right? What is the thing that I'm most worried about? Uh, and there's never enough command points in this scenario that allow you to do all of it. Right? You're like, hey, the solution is there if I use the entire deck, right? But I can't. Mm -hmm. I use a small, small sliver of that deck, and I have to figure out what is my current threat, what is the closest alligator to the boat now, and what can I get later, and be like, you know what? That supply problem is a turn three, turn four problem. And I'll start thinking about it, but I have to survive one, two, and three first, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes those rationalizations are good. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they pair in um, just poorly, right, with the other team that you're playing, right? Because they're not thinking of the problem the same way you are. So they may have advantage because they're just a wild card, right? Uh, which is also very interesting because I've played with military officers and uh, enlisted, but also civilian students and civilian analysts. And uh, I mix and match the teams and stuff. So sometimes it's really interesting to see uh, how civilians see the problem very differently mm -hmm. than um, the process oriented thinkers of our, uh, our military officer ranks and enlisted ranks. Uh, and they just surprise each other sometimes. Both. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a, that's really cool. Now, uh, when it comes to when I think I'd asked you this in the past, just in a, in a conversation we'd had, but um, I'm not sure if you did this for the uh, we were talking at that time, not the commercial release. But when it comes to the JCCs, have you worked up any like packages or suggested uh, packages for people when they're playing for the first time and say, hey, we recommend getting this card, this card, this card, just for your first play so that way you don't get overwhelmed. Because when you're looking at those cards, it can be a little, little overwhelming for the first timer. And then uh, I think that's going to be the cards themselves are going to be the type of thing that people who are into the game are going to sit down and just analyze and, and let's, <laughs> yeah. let's build little packages and write them down and remember for later. So yeah, I, this is going to be the situation I'm in now. I'm going to grab this package or that package or whatever. So it's a little easier, but it's going to be uh, real interesting to explore for the gamer. But for the first timer, are you going to give many you know, tips and hints on how to, uh, um, what to pick first? Uh, because I am a cruel overlord, I did not. Uh, but it is something I'm working on. <laughs> cruel overlord. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is something I'm working on now because in the littoral commander Europe version, we're thinking about packages, right? Mm -hmm. um, about being like, hey, you have this package, right? Like you have an ISR package and what's that mean, right? And so forth. Um, and we thought, um, and honestly, it was a bit also a little bit of time thing. As I, I was like, uh, if do we push back the deadline potentially another three weeks for me to work on this and stuff, right? That was back in September, or October, August, right? Um, when we were discussing it, and uh, we're like, no, if I whenever I finish doing it, right, I'll just release it as a PDF and we'll PDF. share it, on, right? Um, and it's not a big deal, and uh, it doesn't need to be one of those things that is glossy because it's probably one of those things you throw away after you get smart with the game, <laughs> anyway. Um, but yeah, so that's one thing I'm working on right now. Uh, I also, I am working on the designer, uh, journal and, um, I'm hoping to release that when the game hits or starts going out to people. Uh, but I've been working on it for the last few weeks and like, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm like, it's done. I don't have nothing to say anymore. But then I go back and I'm like, okay, maybe I'll add this. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, oh, I'm done. I'm done. Crap, I didn't add this. Let me go back and change it. Uh, and sometimes we... it, it's some. Sometimes it's from the really great questions on the forum that people pose, or on Discord, or people ask me on Twitter, and they're like, "Hey, like, we've been playing your Vassal module because we sent the Vassal module out to um, our backers, right?" Mm -hmm. So they're like, "Hey, can you explain this rule a little bit?" Or like, "Oh, why did you do it this way?" I get a lot of "Why did you do it this way?" Mm -hmm. questions. Which I always appreciate because it, all, it has this discussion. Because as a designer, I like to explain. I'm like, this is why I did. These are the design choices, right? Do you mm -hmm. think these were good design choices? And sometimes they're like, no, right? And sometimes they're like, yeah, absolutely, totally understand, right? Um, but you get it's always a good discussion of why, right? Well, it's good that they're thinking. Uh, they're they're wanting to know why you did that. Uh, the drawback though is like. Well, if you have that gamer that says, why did you do it this way? Well, because I wanted to present this challenge. No, it shouldn't be like that. It should be balanced. It's like, no, it's not yes. going to be balanced. Yeah. 
That's the uh, point. <laughs> yeah, actually, I would say the the biggest pushback I've gotten from some traditional gamers is that, like it should be balanced. I'm like, no, All right? I fundamentally <laughs> just disagree, right? Um, like for example, some of the scenarios like uh, in the book, like the Taiwan scenario when we were playtesting it, mm -hmm. um, some of the games, I both red and blue, won sometimes in that scenario like one or two turns, even though it's supposed to be like a six six to seven turn game right sure and people are like oh it's broken right uh or like when i tested it with like normal board gamers they're like oh it's broken i'm like no it's not right i want it this way right i want to i want them to know in the first turn first two turns if you totally f up right mm -hmm. uh, it can go sideways so quickly you are just bone right oh, yeah. uh, like this is like this is it's not like you can't win right but it is like a you know I mean a watered down Kobayashi Maru, right? And it's like it can go badly, and it can get get off the sked, skeds real quick, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they're like, oh, then what happens? You only play for an hour. I'm like, great, cool. Like now you have turned a three hour game into an hour game, right? But also I'm like, then you reset, reset and do it again. And then do it again. <laughs> it seemed like such a silly question to me, um, but I understand uh, they're also like understanding. Like if I set up an OCS. Uh, scenario which takes forever right mm -hmm. uh, and then it ended in like less time than it took me to to set up the game i would yeah. sort of be peeved too right but the total commander is not that much set up right it's pretty easy to reset right mm -hmm. um and you know what i mean the idea is just like okay so like what do you do right and also have the discussion um about like why did it happen this way right um and so forth right so but yeah it's yeah some of the scenarios are really hard for one player or another player or both players right um you know luzon is probably like the most balanced of it but even the balancedness is different over time over iteration right like for example mm -hmm. uh luzon tends to favor uh if both players are brand spanking new right and they all have the same knowledge base red tends to win the first game of luzon right um just typically, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the they're just they have a little bit of an easier um, uh, decision space to sort of navigate, and they're it's a much clearer goal, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, because they know where they want to go, and they mm -hmm. know what they have, right? The other way, but also over time, blue tends to win more, right? Because they have a lot more resiliency that they're and uh, adaptability, which is. Uh, of winning in different ways, right? Um, versus uh, red, which has a, f uh, a, a less level of variation because of their formation, which makes it easier to play the first time, right? Because, like, because you're like, sure. oh, like I have a lot of ships. The ships do these things. I don't have to worry about terrain, all this stuff, right? But then eventually, right? Those that those same factors that made it really easy to play over a long term, you're like, crap. He knows exactly what my ships have, right? Uh, there's only so much things that my ships can do, right? Uh, I can't use terrain the way land units can, uh, and all my things are on one ship instead of broken across multiple formations, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of that, right? Uh, so uh, that's the interesting bit about balance about games, right? But um, depending on your audience, and which is my audience is like, hey, I want war gamers to really think about warfare and how wars can go really off the rails real quick, especially at the tactical end. I don't want it to be balanced all the time. No, because then you just think that, well, uh, fights are just, I throw one, you throw one, I throw, no, I'm going to try to hit you six times before you can even raise up your defenses. That's that's how you really want to fight. Oh, yeah. uh, and people don't understand that. They think, okay, I, you threw a punch, now I get to throw. No, <laughs> yeah. that's not the way it works. <laughs> but I, I think also when it comes down to it, uh, the other thing that they have to remember is the lethality of everything today is so high that if you make one mistake and I can get in two or three strikes in on you game over, you know, oh, and yeah. that's, it's like, wow, that happened really fast. Well, what was, this is the time for you to pause and go, okay, what happened? What did I do wrong? What did you do? Right? What was, what went your way? What went against me? And then together hash it out. I think that's where the post game discussion could be as fun as the game itself and you can then kind of dig in a little deeper and then maybe even write yourself a little AAR quick one. It's like, hey, did this. Don't do that next time. <laughs> you know, things like that uh, to remember. And then you'll improve. And of course, there's always luck and chance that throws things off along with JCCs. Oh, yeah. So for those who are watching, I'll, I'll give you guys all a hint is the game rewards coordination among team members. Like the game fundamentally is designed that you must coordinate with 
like your teammate, right? And the teams that coordinate their strategy and tactics amongst all the players in a cogent way and are, are thinking of themselves not as separate uh, players, right? But as gears in the same machine, they tend to win 100%. A lot like you're significantly higher chances of winning any scenario than others, right? If you're just like, hey, Mo, you have this area and I have this area and we'll split the cards, like split the points like from eight command points and we'll just split them down the middle, right? That can win sometimes, right? But most times, and fundamentally, the, you, the game is rewards. Uh, the game engine itself, right? And the scenarios were really designed to be like, hey, Sebastian and Mo, how do you coordinate your fires, right? Across your turns, right? Also across your domains and across your across your capabilities right be like hey uh mo your ship so you reach out the d fires i'll do the small stuff right i'll provide you isr on this turn and you do the fires and then when they get close and you're uh, uh you'll play some cards for me and i'll do the fire so we'll trade back and forth right and have this coordinated effect of where i engage where you engage how you do these things where you take risk right versus just saying hey mo you take this half i take this half right uh because i play war games like that where you're just like this is the line of our <laughs> command line between yeah. us war gamers you take that side of the you're in soviet union army and you're in this is my side and we'll just march into the into the breach right mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll make fun of each other as like oh over pretzels and beers and be like hey mo like why is your line all jacked up right um <laughs> and we can still win right uh sure. but this is not that game right this game is really about you are always talking to your teammates right or you should be uh to win if you really want to no, I think that's great. You know, it's like, uh, well, I have this capability that you don't have, so let me do this now, and then I'll hand off when it comes into your realm. And I think that's that's uh, a great way of also building like a team building exercise you can have use this game for. And one of the things that I noticed from playing uh, this game myself, this was one of the first things that popped to mind. We have a question about that right here. How do you model the logistics system for the units in a game, especially when they're isolated on small islands, which I think is the biggest issue for the MLR myself. Yeah, no, yeah. which is a, a issue that uh, I include in the game, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm an advocate of the Marine Littor Regiment of Force Design 2030 of a lot of the uh, changes. Obviously, I made a whole freaking game about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do recognize there are challenges to it, right? For example, um, looking at the beginner scenario for Luzon Straits, like, you can fire a lot of things, and, like, the game only gives you one of the three companies of logistics. Uh, so in the game, the logistics only tracks um, munitions, so missiles, right, or uh, rounds or things like that. It doesn't track uh, food or fuel, okay? only munitions, right? Um, so and that is tracked by uh, categories of combat values. <clears throat> so there's close, uh, uh, close assault, uh, or ground combat, uh, which is green, right? And that has its own tracker, uh, purple, which is, uh, counter air, air defense, and then red, which is fires, right? Uh, and then there's a logistics company that essentially has like a, this is the one thing I didn't like, but it was the only way to simply do it, which is, uh, it has a tracker that essentially is like Amazon, which it will give you whatever you ask for up to 20 mm. times, right? For example, for a Marine Corps uh, logistics company, right? So if you're like, hey, I need five IADs, all right? Uh, uh, munition re -rounds. So like, you're like, They're like, okay, cool, up to five, right? They have a, a limit on how much capacity they can push out a turn and how far that logistics can go, right? So there's a distance uh, and uh, capacity issue. And there's also a finite supply issue, right? Uh, but you'll find out, right, that when you're firing six missiles to f kill a ship or or what we call missiles, they're really salvos, right, of four to six missiles, right, per dice, then you are consuming supply at a rapid rate, right, like significantly, right? Um, so the question becomes, what happens when your your CLB or your um, uh, company logistics, uh, you know what I mean, really uh, can't keep up, right? Um, and there are cards that allow you to do resupply of those logistics companies, right? So, for example, you can have watercraft, Navy watercraft, come in and drop off in a port, and uh, essentially cubes, and they your seal uh, your CLB will consume that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that comes with its own dangers, right? Because that card can be intercepted at sea or, or at port, and essentially it causes a, a special combat where uh, you can like the enemy can strike it to represent its attrition over the sea, right? Without actually playing it. Right. Um, and then like the thing could have uh, 
uh, the card may bring eight, right? But because of how many strikes it took, right, it may only drop you two. And you're like, crap, that was a five card or five command point card and has given me two more supply. I'm like, F, right? Uh, right? Um, So there are games where um, there is one of the Riku's games, which is just purely about resupplying Okinawa, right? That you're Mm -hmm. escorting against uh, a submarine threat, and we wanted them to think about this problem. Um, Also, um, I do these uh, scenarios um, sort of myself that I like to do because uh, then I'm like, hey, how do you do lift, right? Because there are C-130s in the game that you allow you to do some lift and stuff, right? Of like what units do you push in forward uh, first and so forth and what supply do you do but also one of the things i will play with like mo and i if we play enough times is be like hey instead of one tracker that can be anything like because logistics essentially has wild supply like a wild card supply they can fit anything up to 20 times right um, i will force mo to make decisions of like how many red supply how many purple supplies how many green supplies will you take with you and you're just like you know mm-hmm. i'm taking zero green supply right because we're going to be on island and rearing engaging in bayonets and like close like five five six round like shooting on this island we're we're pretty hosed already right so i'm not worried about that so i'm gonna bring lots of air defense i'm gonna bring lots of missiles right um but then other scenarios you may like i'm bringing a lot of green stuff because i intend to be in a firefight all the time right um and the fires i'm gonna bring a little bit and i'm not even gonna bring air defense or resupply right those mm. are choices you can make and it's a really simple like uh um advanced rule that you can do that's real interesting right there to, to drill down like that, because that is always going to be the problem when you are isolated, when you're, when you're uh, on islands, you can't just, you know, say, Hey, let's run down the street. It, well, you can only run down the street so far until you're at the end of the island and whatever yeah. you brought with you, it's like camping in the middle of nowhere. It's, uh, whatever you got on your back is what you're going to live with. Uh, and, well, maybe that'll change in the future as Amazon drone delivery really kicks in, but yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but so it- I will. So I will also say. So like uh, in the Luzon scenario, there's like the Babanu Islands up in the north, where a lot of the Marine Corps players typically set up, right? Um, mm-hmm. And uh, the logistics companies can't resupply over water by themselves organically by the rules, right? Mm-hmm. So, but there's a card that allows you to have vertical uh, heavy lift, right? To have uh, heavy lift, you know, the 53s uh, lift uh, supply, and essentially extend your range over water and terrain, right? But it's a card. You have to be like, I want 53 like uh, helicopters, right, or um, the type of helicopters, right, um, to support me and provide me the support. But that's more command points that you don't get for something else, right? So there are ways to fix this, right, uh, to at least in the short term or even the long term be like, hey, I want resupply from this thing. But that also means you have to be like, I need to defend this port. I need to have defend uh, this other thing and so, and so forth, right, uh, to make sure these things survive to the point that I get, uh, uh, need them. Oh, it's true. Yeah, I'm just actually pulling up the uh, thing for today. I was uh, I was uh, trying to get to what time you were. Okay, that's at uh, three p- 1,500, 1,400 for uh, Central for me. You've got your Littoral Commander demo that you're going to yep. be running. And uh, talk a little bit about that demo for the people who are here now and are curious about what they can expect in the demo. Yeah, so for the demo, I want to walk through some of the basic rules and so be like, hey, and also go through some cards, right? Uh, because, you know what I mean, I'll, it'll be via Vassal and I'll share my screen and everything. And the idea is that um, I'm going to take a lot. There'll be a little bit of a conversation. So we'll walk through some scenarios. We'll walk through the Luzon scenario a little bit um, and, you know what I mean, play through some cards and choices and be like, hey, like, you know, a lot of people to really ask a lot of questions because there are the base rule game. I can explain to you like, 20 minutes right there are some mm-hmm. edge cases though in the game like all games right that are sort of like trickier to explain right submarines are a little trickier to explain right that's why the luzon scenario doesn't have submarines all right uh right um the straits of malacca ha- is like the next scenario after it that has submarines and totally messes people up um right um and then uh soft is its own little thing that it's sort of special right um and so forth but uh, and then there's an influence mechanic that they, plays differently than most people think. Uh, some people ignore it. Some people really love it. Um, one of the things I would like to do for a next batch of scenarios for the Littoral Commander for this current release is to think of scenarios that are just about influence, right? Or a lot more about influence in the tactical space, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so that's you know things I'm toying around with. Yeah, that's really cool. And it, it'll be a lot of fun. So 
3 p.m. Eastern for those who have uh, not already signed up. Let me see what the event has. We've got uh, one, two, three. There's so there's four people in, mm -hmm. and being that you're going to be explaining, you're not going to be having people play. Uh, right, correct. Uh, so I may have people play. It depends on how many people show up and how many. Okay. Uh, what the capacity is and so forth. Yeah. Well, even if you have people play, you can still have an unlimited amount of people that can sit there and, yeah. and watch and observe. Yeah. And so, if you are not necessarily wanting to play or needing to play, or you, you're you're finishing up something like I, I've got the chat with Bruce at that time, I'll probably jump in afterwards and try to catch some of it because I'm just going to be curious to see how the new Vassal looks and how uh, the the final version looks compared to what I had played in the past. And also just see, just get a refresher. It's been a while. So it should be a lot of fun and uh, real interesting. And I strongly recommend anybody who's curious about this game at all to go check it out. And with that, I think we're going to wrap up here. If we have any other questions from the audience, uh, go ahead and post them up now. We're going to wrap up here, not right at this moment, but very shortly we will. And I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Last call, basically. And, and this is a great question. What professional reading recommendations do you have to get the most out of the game? All right. Of course, a SWO would ask this question. Uh, <laughs> uh, great question. And that's actually one of the things I put in my uh, designer journal, which I would give you a sneak peek of. So one of the things I wanted to do is very be very transparent about where I got my ideas and who influenced me and uh, where my sources were about the decisions I made. Um, so there's like a little bibliography because you know I me, mean? I'm a researcher at heart, right? Uh, and a game designer. So I always have a bibliography for my designer journals. And I love them when I had them in games that I played, right? I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. show me readings that, that you got interested in. And I also also love um, hearing what readings affect other writers right? uh, and designers like Voco and Jason. Um, when I talk to them about games, I'm just like, hey, um, <laughs> recovering slow. Uh, uh, even worse. Uh, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but um, so there are a couple books I would recommend. One right off the bat, if you are uh, a professional, especially in the uh, Department of Navy or Air Force uh, or the Marine Corps, would be um, Fleet Tactics by Wayne Hughes, right, uh, who just passed away recently uh, in the last year or so. Um, and I think it is a fantastic book. Um, you can get um, a lot of insight about it. It can be a little heavy reading. Um um, and, but his fundamental equations about salvo equations and how naval combat works was fundamental to the model of how littoral commander works and uh, makes assumptions about naval combat. If you want an easier version of that sort of book, uh, um, uh, fighting the fleet is another one that came out through proceedings is a great book as well. There are a bunch of great articles in the Gazette, uh, that have shaped my thinking about force design 2030, about HIMAR, shore based logistics and it. And you know what I mean? There's a lot of, uh, interesting stuff going on about it. Right. Uh, so, but if I had to recommend, Oh, um, and is, uh, another book is, uh, Cultivating the a naval mind. Developing uh, the naval mind. Yeah, yes, developing the naval mm -hmm. mind. That's another great book. Um, you know, I mean, a colleague of mine up at um, uh, B.J. Armstrong up at the U.S. Naval Academy. He has written that book, and those those three books, I would say, like, are some of the core books that really shaped my thinking about when I was designing this game, mm -hmm. um, and so forth. Right. Um, and if I if I could, if I if I had the money, I would put those three books together. And shove them in the box, right? Which already is packed, <laughs> right? Uh, and send it to units and be like, read these books, play this game, and read the books again and play the game again, right? Mm -hmm. um, would be my recommendation. Those are fantastic books. Um, other things I would love to uh, do about is um, also add, you know, I mean, MCDP, uh, uh, you know, I mean, maneuver uh, warfare and so forth like that, because that was also a key element of what how I think of how do we adapt a maneuver warfare. Uh, as a philosophy, as a way of thinking to the next iteration of challenges, right? Mm -hmm. uh, beyond what we think of maneuver warfare in the Cold War, right? Sure. Yeah, it's it totally, warfare Warfare is always going to be there. It just evolves, yeah. changes yeah. You know, like anything else based on equipment. I mean, a, a good example in a, in a funny way uh, of that is, uh, have you seen the new Top Gun, Top Gun Maverick? Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> Remember the scene where he, he's get the, he gets the old, tomcat up in the air you know oh yeah they, they had to have that in there a lot of fan service i thought yeah, it was fantastic yeah. a lot of fun well he gets up there and he's going up against a fifth gen and and he takes a shot he gets he gets tone on it pops a missile and that thing just like 
kind of almost flat spin turns on yeah. them. And they're both like, what the fuck just yeah. happened? Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of neat to do that because you're seeing old school, new school and yeah. the, the, the evolution of these tools. Now, yeah. you know, whether it's realistic or not, that yeah. r- remains to be argued and seen. It's Hollywood. It doesn't matter. But it does prove the point that you've got an older aircraft versus a newer aircraft. The newer aircraft can do things that the older one can't do. But Oh, yeah. So. Uh, if you want to talk about old school, new school and stuff like talk to aviators, especially Navy aviators, like, uh, like, oh, like, do you like the P8 or the P3 or you know what I mean, the old school Viking or I mean, mm-hmm. or uh, do you like the Hornets versus the F-35s or even the F-22s, right? Like, I know a lot of Air Force guys are like, the 22 is the best aircraft ever, right? Uh, <laughs> but they're also 22 pilots, right? So it's unsurprising, yeah. right? Uh, but then other people are like, oh, like the, uh, you know, what I mean, uh, the F-16 can do things that uh, even the F-22 can't do because of the way it was engineered or whatever, right? Uh, so it's always interesting. Same thing with swos, right? You know, our recovering swo out there in the audience, right? About <laughs> chips and things, right? Um, and how uh, the old way was uh, sometimes better, but also had different benefits and trade-offs, right? Mm-hmm. And the question is, it's not that one is always better all the time against all scenarios, right? It is, which is what I say, the Battlestar Galactica uh, example, right? Is that your your thing, whatever your capability is, your platform is, your idea is, right? It may be good for a set of problems, right? Um, and then my idea may be a set for a, a set, a different set of problems, right? But the, the question is, not whose idea is better, is really what we're arguing about sometimes about the future of warfare is, what is the future problem set? Mm. Right. Uh, like, for example, um, is it coin? Is it is it uh, great power competition or uh, and uh, you know deterrence and uh, f- potential preparing for a high like end conflict? Like, let's say, like the Cold War was preparing for that. Right. Or is it somewhere in between? Right. Um, mm-hmm. And where and wh- also the question of where will that be? Will it be in Africa? Would it be in uh, in Canada or, or will it be in, in the Pacific? Right. Like you, what you're preparing for is as much about what drives your solution set. Right. Uh, your threat assessment. Right. So I think mm-hmm. that's always so interesting because I work on a lot of future stuff. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, back to the books. Those three books. Amazing. Highly recommend. The Great Canadian Maple Syrup Wars. We'll hey man, be- we got into war with Canada a couple times in our history. <laughs> oh, no, right? I know, I know. It's like uh, we'll, we'll be talking about that one for centuries. Yeah. The maple syrup wars. No, yeah. it, it, you're right. Those three books. I, it was funny because I was like, wait a minute. I think I know where he's going. I got those. That's why I turned around. I was looking at my library. Um, now, uh, fighting the fleet is the one that. Uh, wait. Yeah, it was. Fly, fighting the fleet, not fleet tactics. Fleet tactics yeah. really drills down into it. Fighting oh, yeah. the fleet is is like a higher level. Uh, so that for a gamer, I think that would be the one that yeah. really uh, will be good, like a good primer. And then you want to drill down a little deeper. And you literally, can uh, it is sitting the over there by my couch mm-hmm. right now uh, because I always go back to it a little bit and brush up. Um, but yeah, fleet tactics really drove the the salvo equations. Uh, and mm-hmm. if you're like a, a advocate of, or an acolyte of Wayne Hughes's and his work, and you see Wayne Hughes's fingerprints on uh, uh, metaphorically, intellectually on the game, there's this, it, it is right there, right? Um, and then um, uh, fighting the fleet came a little bit in the middle of our development of the game. But I was like, yes, yes, like this is it, right? Perfect timing. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was also a great way for me to explain myself uh, to the naval community. Like, this is what I'm trying to explain to you, right? And mm-hmm. fighting the fleet sort of helps it. And also, more than anything, it helps teach Marines the naval component of naval campaigning, right? Of yeah. littoral combat, right? Uh, because a lot of these guys, especially if they're majors and lieutenant colonels, they have been grown up in the coin generation like I was, right? When I was a sergeant. Mm-hmm. the marines and it has shaped their mentality to think about problems a certain way right um for example we're working with um uh high mars uh high mars uh staff of captains right um and they were playing the littoral commander game early on in this process and they were been great advocates and great supporters of the game um and they essentially did fires the way they had done it in afghanistan sent a drone up in the air you know what i mean do ISR uncontested and f- do fires and they have range and all this stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but the first time they were playing it, um, uh, I was playing as, as red and I shot down all their drones. Right. I was like, okay, so how That's you got fair. Else, right? <laughs> and they're like, and they, and they couldn't shoot down. Uh, uh, they, uh, they couldn't, they didn't have enough ammo to like arrange to penetrate my entire IADS. Right. 
So I revealed myself by shooting that in their drone. They would fire at me, but I had enough IS to counter them, right? And um, it was really frustrating for them because I sort of like won by like rolling past them, right? Because I essentially hid myself and they couldn't find me again, right? Because I shot down all their drones, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And by the time they could get new cards again, it was a little too late because I had progressed so fast across the board, right? Um, and they did some things and they killed some ships, but like by learning their lesson. But the next time, um, and they understood like, oh, this Afghan call for fire model, right? Of the sensor to the shooter chain at the battery level is not the same. It does not work fundamentally, right? Mm -hmm. All the time, right? So we need to have layers, right? Uh, and they're like, all right, we're going to use boats. We're going to use, uh, you're going to use cyber means. We're going to use um, drones. We're going to use other types of drones. Or if we're going to have like a bunch of class three drones, like I had one time, <laughs> uh, one uh, Marine group, they literally bought, they're like, hey, they're only there's only so many cards in the deck, right? So they're like, hey, I would like to buy eight of these small drones, but there's not eight of those cards, right? So mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, oh, it's okay. And just like put it on a post card, right? And yeah. just like, you know, just say, hey, I'm buying eight of these, right? And then we'll mark them off as they get destroyed. And he's like, cool, right? And then he attached them to these cards and wrote them on post-its. Uh, and he literally just flooded the battlefield. He's like, I'm gonna swarm this nonsense, right? He's like, I know they're gonna shoot down. I know they're not. Like half of them won't come back. But there, there will be a moment in time. His idea was there's gonna be a moment in time, right? A turn where I have to be ready to fire everything, right? And I have to be careful when I launch these drones up, right? I don't want him to find me or kill these drones before I'm ready to fire, right? There's no point in firing them when they're beyond my weapons engagement zone, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you remember that map where Luzon, they make that little turn on top of the, uh, yep. uh, the northern peninsula of the island. Um, and he waited for them to make that turn. And it, it was a big risk because he's like, hey, I'm not really going to wither them away too much. right? But when they do that, he's just going to flood that space with drones. Uh, and a bunch of them did get shot down and some survived. right? Um, but then he's like, and then he had a bunch of targets. He's like, I'm going to pound these guys. Right. Um, and it was a really close game, right? Like literally down to the last move and last turn and last like dice roll. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was interesting because like he thought about it, he's like, hey, uh, I want uh, these things and this is how I'm gonna do it, right? Um, and he worked his own mental model and adapted and so forth. It was interesting. So the idea of a lot of it's like, how do I adapt my thinking of what my past experiences are and add new experiences through this game? No, that's true. And you know, it's funny because what you said is so true. We're so ingrained we have generations now that are in the coin model and in this uh one-sided fight model when it comes to technology and, and owning the domains uh not the ground necessarily but when it comes to the aircraft and uh, you know your isr everything uh we own all that we have in all these you know battles we've been in uh if, and now you're going back to kind of like the soviet era where the enemy has the same capabilities or similar capabilities. And now it's a trade-off. There's a risk involved in, well, I need to get ISR. Well, they may get shot down. Odds are they probably will get shot down. And I think some people may be looking at the, the drones that are coming out, like the footage and the talk that comes out of the Ukraine right now, uh, the Ukraine war, and think, well, they're still having that capability. I mean, it's almost similar to the U.S. They're having that capability. It's like, well, how many drones get shot down every day? And where are they use, utilizing these drones? And there's not even combined arms being used in a lot of these, these instances. So it's just infantry against infantry. So no one's going to have capability. Well, not no one, but they're generally not going to have that capability. So it's it, uh, to take out the ISR. That's where the, the there has to be a shift in thinking, you know, and, and that's a game like this is going to help. Um, make that happen yeah hopefully uh, i have high hopes about the game and uh i was actually just talking to a colleague of mine who's another dod professional game designer and he was saying like hey like are you worried about the like the commercial civilian hobby reception of your game because like i i, I am pretty straightforward I'm like this game was originally a professional military education game right mm -hmm. and it had converted and it has been and i ripped out as much of the jargon as i can i promise i swear i did i tried um, like the original rule set had a bunch of doctrine in it, like it had doctrine references and things like that that we stripped out for people. Um, and then people are like, "Hey, what about some doctrine references?" I was like, "God damn you guys!" <laughs> right? Uh, right? Damn um, if you do, damned if you don't. Right? You know? Um, I was like, "Uh, right." So there's a little bit of that, but. Um, I was like, eh, I'm not too worried about it because I didn't get into board game design to be like, uh, you know what I mean? Like a millionaire, right? Uh, mm -hmm. 
that's a, there's that joke of like how do you create a, a massive small fortune in board games is to <laughs> start with a large fortune in board games right exactly um so i, I i'm of that sk- skeptical financial point of view right so i really just really designed this game to make people think about well uh the the problems of the future right on the battlefield mm-hmm. but also to help future ncos and future uh company grades and field grades to really think about the problem really hard because it matters a lot to me i was a former marine i was an 03 11 infantry guy um you know i mean uh, of the coin generation uh, of iraq right so i think mm-hmm. it, i wish we had more chances to, to practice our brains and exercise our thinking more then and i want that opportunity for future marines and current marines yeah, hundred percent agree on that, and that's we've talked about this, or you know, uh, many times about. Uh, I know that you know, with the war game practitioners, they're going for the the field grade and above. You know, these these guy the the civilian and military leadership, they're going for that. Uh, I think there needs to be more attention paid to your lower ranks, uh, oh, yeah. from the privates all the way up to your your know, company command and battalion command, things like that, to be actively pursuing. Uh, games like this and thinking tactically. Now, it, people may say, well, it's really not my job to do that. It doesn't matter if it's your job or not. It's getting you thinking tactically. It's getting oh, yeah. you seeing the problem and then trying to resolve the problem and, and, and take on the challenges. And I think that's really important for everybody, especially the non-rates and, and the young yeah. NCOs and stuff like that to start thinking critically because you're building, you're developing those leaders of tomorrow by doing that. Oh, yeah. So I will share another quick anecdote where uh, Kali Mai, who's a major out in Okinawa, he I sent him one of the early prototype versions, um, uh, and he was like, I, he was just in his office, like, I, like with the pieces out, trying to figure out the game, and sort of like, you know, unboxing, right? Like putting <laughs> the cards out, looking at the cards, looking at the rules, right? Uh, and had the map laid out, and he wasn't even playing; he was just sort of like sorting, right, and trying mm-hmm. to understand and make his way through the rule book. And he said, uh, Marines of all ranks, right? Like ma- other other majors, other uh, uh, captains that work for him, but also like NCOs, like, you know what I mean? Like corporal sergeants, right? And even gunnies, they're like rolled through his office. Like, oh, what are you doing there? To the point that he had a crowd around it. He's like, <laughs> hey guys, like I was trying to understand. Like they would keep asking him questions like, oh, why does this card say? What does this mean? Or blah, blah, blah. Oh, like, what do you mean about this capability? This is, what do you mean? This is a red capability. And he said, more people asked and engaged about Force Design 2030 and about the problem set, about why they were thinking about these problems and why they were doing this thing in that single day than they did over months of like PowerPoint slides and briefings and classes and stuff. And he goes like, he's like, we didn't even play. We just had the cards laid out, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I will will admit like some of my favorite sessions after uh, playing my game with like uh, the military crowd is to be, or even hobby crowd be like, what cards should we include in the next one? Right. It's my favorite. It's my favorite question to ask uh, players. Right. Um, it's not like, did you enjoy the game or anything like that? It's like, okay, it's now that you play, like what cards are missing? Right. Or what cards mm. or capabilities or technology, especially if they're future oriented. Right. Because there's cards in my deck that are obviously present for us, easy. You know, everyone sort of knows what they do. Uh, but, uh, there are capabilities, like, for example, there's a card that says uh, Cut the Link, which is a card that essentially uh, uh, disables unmanned systems, right? We're just mm-hmm. like, hey, we're going to cut that link between you and the controller, and it's going to mess up all... So if you, if you're like, if you have gone heavy on the unmanned systems on your cards, like, that card can wreck your day, right? Sucks to be you. <laughs> right? Uh, there's a cyber exploit card that increases the, the probability of success for all the cyber cards for, like, a turn, right? Mm-hmm. For you to, like, you can do, like, a huge cyber attack move, right, if you have that card, right? Um, there are other things, like, you know, uh, engineering and obstacles and so forth, right? But the idea is, like, hey, what cards do you think we are missing? What technologies should we be thinking about in the 2030, 2040 range that we are not thinking about now, right? Um, uh, one of the uh, most common answers like uh, see burning right like chemical biological radiological uh and explosive weapons right those mm-hmm. that that's something that comes up and i'm like oh you got i was out and I, I will admit this right i will be like i did not include see burning stuff mainly because uh i have like uh research trauma from doing a see burning project uh, <laughs> back in my early days as an analyst but also um it just made things way too complicated and, and deviated from the sensor to shoot or train kill web uh mental uh, focus of the of the game um, but that's something I'm like, yeah, you know what? Like, I should really think about how we should think about doing that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, especially as we think about different theaters and different command or different uh, uh, tactical problem sets, right? Sure. Um, but there, yeah, so I, there's so many things that I love to to dig more into um, uh, into the game. Well, even if you 
did come up with that, you know, like uh, with uh, when it comes to like Sabrina stuff, if you did that after the fact and you, well, okay, I got two cards that I created for this and, and the rules, you can just throw it up as a PDF, say, hey, most of you people, w when it comes to playing the game, you're going to be sleeving your cards. So oh, you yeah. just take another card that you have an old card laying around, you just print it, print it out on a piece of paper, slide it in there. Now you got a new, new card to use in the game. Oh, yeah. So it's not a big deal. Or you can even just put that one in a card sleeve if you're not sleeving the others because um, the, it's not like you're shuffling the deck and drawing oh, yeah. randomly. Yeah. You're yeah. picking from them. So so I've done that. Uh, that's how the cards evolved, honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, there was uh, 24, 25 cards. Mm -hmm. There are 112 in each deck now. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> right? right? <laughs> um, so uh, so the, the cards have expanded considerably. Um, but I will share... Uh, one last hand does so we don't go too long, but is uh, I was working with an a engineer support battalion um, and they were helping me test the game. I sent it to them. They're running games, right? And one of their emails was great. They give a lot of great positive feedback. They're like, oh, it's great. You know, we loved it. We played it out in the field. So they played it in like a field tent. It was, it was pretty awesome, right? Um, and and I was like, yeah, awesome. But they're like, <clears throat> but they're like, hey, but we we uh, because they're engineers, right? The combat engineers. <clears throat> they're like, we do more than IEDs and counter mining. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, like because I'm like, I in that, in that <laughs> moment I realized that's what I as a coin generation of the Iraq generation of Marines saw them as, right? I'm like, sure, you guys make you just get rid of IEDs for me, get rid of mines for me, right? Mm -hmm. Things like I call you up, you clear the roads for me, right? Uh, and they're like, we do all these other things. Like, we can create obstacles. We can do heartening. We can do expedition repairs, right? And they gave. And the cool thing is, like, they gave me not only the real world explanation of what they do in real life. They after they played it, uh, played the game. They're like, this is what we will say the game rules are. I'm like, cool, man. Like, that's awesome. So I ginned them mm. up on a PDF and sent it to them. They're like, cool. Like, add this to your deck, right? Um, and I I'd done some similar things for like air wing folks. So they're like, Hey, we will love more air wing things and stuff like that. Um, and I was like, Oh, that's so cool. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I highly encourage people, even in the designer journal say, Hey, make your own cards, uh, make your own packages. You know what I mean? Uh, adapt to cards. Like I don't mind. Like, uh, for example, uh, you can sharpie cards, change values. If you're like, Hey, I don't like these values. I'm going to change them. House rules. Like go for it. Like go for it like it's yours you bought it you can do whatever you want with it um sure. but i would also love to hear it because i love what people are doing with the game and making it their own oh that's really cool and you need to justify it too i think personally oh, yeah. you can't just say well i i i knocked this down to a two or i raised it to a three or whatever because of balance yeah. that should be the last thing you want uh you yeah. know you should want at least uh, the way i look at it is you want more accuracy to real world uh as much as you can like if it comes out oh you know what we thought it had this capability it actually has this capability which is better or worse where it's okay well we have that card in the game let me change it then to reflect the real world a little bit better and then we have this from brant saying hey you can console mo about the relative lack of tanks uh, in the game no so there are technically <laughs> tanks in the game it's just well, yeah. chinese tanks yes uh, <laughs> which is uh, and they're yeah. also light tanks they're uh the panthers mm. um what they, i think they call it black uh i think they call them black panthers um 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 but yeah so yeah there are no tanks in, <laughs> on the marine corps side there At are yeah. yeah so <laughs> and it, it is a fundamental so i will say this though right is um, and this is shown in the Luzon Straits, and that's why I designed the two, uh, the two versus two scenario the way it did is, which is a surface action group by the Chinese versus uh, essentially a company plus of uh, really a battalion minus of infantry and tanks by um, uh, uh, by the Chinese versus two MLRs, right? Um, and one of the things that you notice right, right away is like if if the infantry closes uh, with uh, the Chinese infantry closes with the the fires right of mm -hmm. the marine corps like they're sort of smoke checked <laughs> right mm -hmm. but they have to like they have to close the distance which is hard right because you can get fired upon they don't have as much a robust air defense as uh the marine latour regiment so you know what i mean one likes to be a far distance one likes to be in close distance and there's a tension there mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then on um, add the, the the complication of the ships right um so that's all very interesting and it's, it makes the scenario fun right sure. um to solve right but with tanks right like the question is like add tanks right uh if you want right 
uh, make a counter, you know, make a JCC that does it, right? Uh, you could treat it like a UGV and be like, hey, I'm attaching a tank, right? And what would that do, right? But the other question is like, uh, where, what scenarios also would be like, where are tanks useful, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if my core mission, which is what the Luzon straight one is about, C denial, C control, like then tanks is probably not as useful, right? Especially if I'm just fa facing all ships, right? But mm -hmm. If I'm fighting a, like a more traditional uh, battalion combat team versus another battalion combat team, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're like, you're like, oh, like mm, this may yes. be problematic, right? Uh, because the tanks do kill at a higher ground assault rate than uh, the infantry guys, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they can be your heavy hitters that can really demolish platoons and um, and can be really really bad, right? Um, so, but the thing is, like, okay, so. Um, Maybe there's a way for me to negate their light tanks by having my combat rating go up, right? And my hit points go up a little bit. Maybe not as good as the tanks, but have by having the UGVs mentioned before, right? Mm -hmm. And so forth. Or do I just use obstacles? Like, do I just put landmines, right? Which are, are there's a card of scatter mines, right? I'm gonna deploy high mars, like to pick them and sort of things like that, or like deploy mines that were like you, like I'm just gonna make it. Yes, if you get to me, right. I'm going to get wrecked by your tank, right? But if I make it so difficult for you to get to me, right, by using sure. engineers, increasing mobility, all this stuff, then there are other ways to solve the, 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 the problem, right? Mm -hmm. Which is what I want my players to think about, right? Um, and you're also like, <laughs> I was thinking about, uh, should we include tanks in the next one of like, you should experiment with what the, the, the other one could do. We mm -hmm. thought about putting tanks in this game, um, mainly because, and I got rid of that because, of the counter, uh, the number of counters that we're adding to the box eventually was a limiting factor, uh, sure. along with the four maps that we put in. So like wow. the box is like literally brimming. Um, so as you open it, uh, so um, you'll you'll have a lot of things in there. I mean, um, from two decks of 112 cards and a bank decks and all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the rule books and scenario book and stuff like that. So there's a lot in it, but I'm thinking about adding. Um, There'll be tanks for sure for some element of like uh, the European side, whether it's the Russians or uh, the army or even the Marine Corps element that uh, just allowing them to do it. Right. So, yeah. sure. I mean, well, and that's uh, that's a whole different conversation, too. That's the whole um, the force design 2030 that, that that's its own you know conversation, which is where the removal of tanks is part of it branch just busting my chops because there's no tanks to play with but i'm not really concerned about tanks to play with because it was just on the fd2030 side that's where i have reservations and concerns i'm also old, older school which is kind of the way that if things are going it seems like the older marines versus the newer marines it's yeah. like there's that split and i think uh and and i think it's it's a valid uh, a valid discussion to have i mean it's an important discussion to have and this is why again uh, Littoral Commander, I think, is a is a great game to dig into because there are valid discussions, important discussions to have, and you never know what kind of impact or what kind of input, I should say, um, and information can be gathered from repeated plays, and then some people have some ideas, and that does have impact down the line uh, because this is still a thing in process. I mean, in development, oh, yeah, it's, it's, absolutely, it's not it's not set in stone yet, and. Uh, uh, that is where, you know, things like this can help in the evolution of the design itself, which I think, I mean, the force design, you know, the MLR yeah. in the real world. So I think that's pretty cool. But uh, I think that's it with our questions. We did have Pete was saying that he's going to be dropping in at three o'clock to check out the demo. So that's going to be great. And then uh, <laughs> we got an uh, excellent adaptability, resilience, fire effectively exactly. first. <laughs> uh, Wayne Hughes, right? Right. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Fire first, fire last. I always tell that to my students. I'm like, um, and I always actually, uh, when I play with my uh, my Marines or the students that we play with, right? I'm like, hey, I'm like, who has read read? My first question is like, who has read Wayne Hughes? And like the few hands that go up, I'm like, you guys are going to do well. The rest of you, you guys are going to feel pain, right? Uh, you're going to feel <laughs> why you should have read Wayne Hughes before you came to this game. Um, but yeah, it's great. For, it's great. It's like um, <clears throat> they're like. Uh, I always laugh. Um, I always ask my uh, last little bit. It's like um, players are always uh, because they're hesitant about how much ammo they have. They're like, oh, I see this enemy ship. I'm going to fire like two dice at it. Right. But I'm like, like, that's not going to do anything. It's like rare, unless you get incredibly lucky and they roll like terrible, they have enough IS to get through, uh, like defend against that. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're working as a group. Right. 
And I'm like, you have to fire really effectively, really first and really overwhelm or penetrate or so find some way, cyber or EMS or some other way to degrade their ability to intercept, right? Um, like we talked about before, right? So mm -hmm. you can have, uh, you can kill more things without so much volume, right? All right, uh, because as soon as you fire your reveal, right? So you never want the uh, what the uh, worst case scenario is like. You never want to be out of schlicks and be revealed and then firing back at you in anger, right? Like yeah. it is that is a very bad day, uh, and that's how your ships get sunk really easily in the game. So the idea is really the core tension of the game is like when do I fire? How do I fire? Right? And how do I keep myself so alive by hiding myself or making myself more survivable, right? Mm -hmm. More resilient. Yeah, no, that's true. You wanna you wanna make sure that you get that shot, and if you're gonna take it, you might as well it, it, don't throw a jab, throw a haymaker. Oh yeah, and, right. and you know the, the like the old thing that I used to always say is gonna hit you hard, fast, and continuously. And oh yeah, that, that's what so you, you want to stop. Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, and and overwhelm you, and and that's where the, one of the other interesting things is if you have um, enough shots on an island, if you got a good supply line out in the sea. They don't. Oh, yeah. So you can overwhelm them and then they're, they're, they're Winchester and it's like, hey, great. Now, uh, now I can have my time with you, you know, <laughs> because uh, but it's it's not that easy to get to that point. Yeah. So but uh, yeah. So I think we're going to wrap it up here. We uh, went a little over the intended time, but that's great. It's more information, more great discussion. And uh, hopefully everybody got something from this. And if you haven't already gone over to the site, DeetsFoundation.org is where you can place an order for Littoral Commander, which will be shipping in about four to six weeks or so. So hopefully by mid to late February, uh, people will start receiving it on their doorsteps. So if you've not placed an order, go ahead and do so now. And uh, thanks, Sebastian. Really appreciate you coming on today to have this discussion and uh, looking forward to checking out your game next month. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you, Mo. <laughs> Congratulations on getting it done. It's it definitely has got to be a great feeling to have your first commercial war game published. Yeah, it's very exciting. Thanks. All right, guys, we will see you later on. We've got uh, the next one this afternoon I have is with Bruce Maxwell for Aaron Armour. Until then, have a great day, everybody.